This is topic 3.3 and we're looking at physical models. And so physical modeling, what we're doing here is we're actually making something in 3D and we want to be able to do that so that we can use the product within the context of its environment. So it's, it's, it's uh, the context of use and we want to be able to kind of visualize what it would be like in three-dimensional space. So that's kind of what I'm getting at here is that designers use physical models to visualize information in context and in three-dimensional space. Models are often scaled down, so this is what we call scaled models. They're scaled down for large objects and up for very small objects to ease visualization. The primary goal of physical modeling is to test aspects of a product against, their, against user requirements. So that can be within the context of use, and it's also with users involved so that they can get a sense of what it would be like to actually use that product. It's iterative. That means that it, it uh, over time, things change. So iterative changes um, during the product testing ensure that the model suits the needs of the target market. Okay, so iterative changes. Remember that an iteration is like a version. Right? So this is where you would be saying, okay, here's my first version, here's my second version, here's my third version, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Physical modeling allows designers to explore and test and present ideas to others. It's in, this is a way of communicating ideas. It engages clients, um, focus groups, experts um, to interact with physical models of products, allowing designers to gain valuable feedback to enable them to improve the design and product user in interface. Okay, so it's a way of communicating, it's a way of gaining feedback, and it's also just a way of, of seeing whether your, your product can be used within the space that it's meant to be used in. All right, so where do we use it? Well, we're gonna be using it in um, product design, architecture, and engineering. You know, up at, up, up at one of the buildings up on the university, they have a scale model of what the university would look like. You know, and I'm sure they built that actually before they built the university itself. And that would be an example of a physical model, a scaled model, right? It's an architectural model. Um, you might use it in medical research, definitely in the automotive in industry. A bunch of the examples I'm going to show you are from automotive. So let's talk about scale models. So scale models, these are a model that is either smaller or larger than the physical copy of an object. So for instance, this is an, an enzyme. So this is a very small thing. This is the enzyme amylase, and this particular enzyme um, is what your body uses to break down starches into smaller sugars, like for instance, glucose. So, you know, they're far too small for us to see. So we need to, you know, basically create models that allow us to visualize what this thing actually looks like. And so this is a, a physical scaled model of an amylase um, enzyme. Now, you know, the same can be said for something very large, like for instance, you know, the, uh, a globe is an example of, of a perfect example of, of something that's very large that we've made a scaled model to, right? Like you cannot see the entire Earth uh, unless you're out in space or on the moon or something like that, which most of us are not. So therefore, in, in order for us to visualize what the entire Earth looks like, we would look at a globe. Okay, scaled models are accurate representations of objects or features of objects. They allow uh, design teams, clients, and manufacturers to visualize or manipulate um, or examine an object. They are scaled down or up, keeping all sizes of the features in relation to each other. So for instance, if, um, if you are scaling something on the, the x-axis, so like let's say that I want to reduce something by 50% on the x-axis, then I would make sure that I also reduced it by the same amount on the y-axis and on the z-axis. And that would make sure that in the three-dimensional space, all, all measurements are, are proportional. So it's, it's scaling down proportionally, okay? So, or up proportionally, depending on, on what you're doing, okay? So um, scaled models are proportional. Okay, mock-ups. Mock-ups are uh, either a scale model or a full-size representation of a product used to gain feedback from users. Mockups are used to test ideas and gather feedback from users. They can either be full scale or scaled models of a product. They can have some form of functionality, which means they could be considered a prototype as well. Um, as I was looking up, you know, trying to find examples of what mockups look like on the internet, you know, I just did a product mockup um, uh, search on, on, you know, image search on Google, and it, it was interesting. A lot of the ones that came out were um, were 
containers that you would put some sort of cosmetic product in. You know, for instance, these these pumps right here for I don't know, like a, a skin lotion or, or something like that. And it's it's kind of interesting. It's you know they they have some of the functionality, but they are not going to be fully functional. Okay, because they don't actually have the the proper labels on them. They don't have the actual stuff inside them. I think. Well, maybe they do. I'm not sure from the pictures, but. Um, you know they can be considered prototypes, but they are they they don't have full functionality, which is really what a pro, a prototype should have. It really should, for a proper prototype, be fully functional. Okay, so mockups are either somewhat functional or fully functional, but yeah. Um, and again, we're looking for ways that we can test ideas. This is part of the iterative process. Okay, physical models, we're again here at aesthetic models. So now an aesthetic model is a model that is developed to look and feel like the final product, but, but does not have functionality. That's a very key thing, an aesthetic model does not function. So this is an example from the automotive industry of a aesthetic model, this is a Lotus, and it's made out of clay. So this is clay, uh, and it was carved out of a, you know, a large block of clay. Um, you can see that they painted part of it to make it look like the, the finish that you would see on it, but this car does not drive. It looks like a car, but it doesn't actually function. So an aesthetic model is a model of something that does not function as it should. This is an example, another example. These are um, examples of, of hose attachments, but they do not actually function. If they're an aesthetic model, they look like they would function, They've got all of the aspects that, that you would expect them to look like, but they don't actually function. So the internal parts are, are non-functional. Okay, so this is, um, again, a, a model developed to look and feel like the real product. They are used for appearances. So that's what we're looking at, is the appearance of the model. It does not function or operate in any way. That's a very important idea here. Aesthetics. Uh, and appearance models are only for are, and only concerned with form, color, style, texture, and how the product fits in its visual environment. They can be used for ergonomic testing, evaluating visual appeal, allowing the, the non-designer to see and feel how the real product will be, or you talk to your engineer, your production engineer, the guy who's going to actually manufacture it, and that person can then assess how feasible it would be to actually manufacture what you've you've created maybe you know something that you've created with the aesthetic model can't be actually finished the way that you expect it to be so that would be an important part uh, with communicating to production engineers okay so but the key thing with an aesthetic model does not function looks nice looks like it should function doesn't function okay now prototype a prototype is a sample or model built to test a concept or process or act as an object to be replicated or learned from. Um, prototypes can be developed at, with a range of fidelities and for different contexts. Now one of the key things about a prototype is it should work. It should function in the way that it's meant to function. It may not have the materials that the final product will be made out of, but it functions. Okay, So maybe your prototype is made out of cardboard rather than say plastic, or it's made out of plastic instead of uh, metal or something like that, but it, it should function the way that it is intended to function. Okay, So prototypes are used to test and evaluate ideas. A prototype can, can be a real working product made to real specifications that can be used throughout the product design development. It has functionality unlike that of a mock-up which has minimal functionality or lack of it like an aesthetic model. It, it is uh, particularly useful for testing before pro uh, production begins. Um, prototypes help the development team discover the issues related to manufacturing the final product. It also allows the development team to learn from the user through user uh, feedback and user trial interactions with the final prototype. So again, it's a functioning model, fully functioning model that allows you to test ideas, test it in its environment, test it with, um, with uh, your, your target market. So it's really a, a, a fully functioning product. And this actually, you know, like for Criterion C in our, um, in our uh, internal assessment is what you're creating. You're creating a fully functional prototype. Fidelity is the idea, the degree to which a prototype is exactly like the final product. So you can have a, a low fidelity, a medium fidelity, or a high fidelity. 
Okay, um, you know, low fidelity would be using materials that would not be used in the final product. Um, uh, medium fidelity would be using ones that are, you know, some some of the materials are the same, and then the high fidelity would be exactly like you would expect it to be in the final product. Okay, instrumented models are a type of prototype, and they are equipped with the ability to take measurements to uh, provide accurate um, quantitative feedback for analysis. And so basically they're, they're equipped with some sort of sensors, some sensors that, that allow it to um, take measurements to provide accurate, accurate quantitative feedback. So quantitative means numbers, right? Feedback for anal uh, analysis. They can investigate many phenomena such as fluid flow in hydraulic systems or wind tunnels, stress with structures, user interactions with a product. Um, an example might be an instrumented model of a touch screen. So maybe you have a touch screen and you can record the actions of the user and provide data on how often areas of the screen are used and errors that, that uh, um, users might make on that. You know, here's an example of an instrumented model. So this is wind tunnel testing in, um, of, of a car. And again, I told you that uh, the automotive industry is big on this. So, so please do watch this video. Okay, so some advantages and disadvantages of using physical models. Um, an advantage is you can explore and, te explore and test ideas in three-dimensional space, which is great. I mean, in, in two dimensions, that's not going to be as easy. Um, it's easily understandable. Somebody can look at it, feel it, touch it, you know, have an interaction with it. It helps with communication, uh, not only with clients, but also team members. It gives you the ability to manipulate ideas better than drawings. It's tangible. Tangible means that it actually exists. And, and, you know, and it can be used in user trials and user research more readily. Um, some disadvantages are that, that designers can easily make assumptions about how accurate a model representation represents um, reality. So this, this can be a problem, especially if you're looking at scaled models or, or um, mock-ups or you're looking at um, aesthetic models. So they, they can make assumptions that, that how the model you know, is in reality that may not be true. It may not work like the final product. So some of your you know, models may not actually work as your final product would. Uh, it might not be made out of the same materials. It's time consuming to make. There's a level of skill required and it can be costly. So those two things, these three things go together. So making prototype or making um, physical models is more expensive than making, for instance, drawings of, a, of, of something. So graphical models or concept models, which are just simply ideas, right? So they're, they're more expensive because, of their, because they're time consuming, because they... they um, uh, the level of skill required is high, and, and it can be quite costly. Now, some of this is, is come down with things like 3D printing, where you could make a rapid prototype. You know, 3D printing is, is ideal for rapid prototyping of physical models to, to get some idea of how they, how they work. And I would highly suggest that as you're looking at Criterion B in your IA, that you think about doing some physical models of your, of your design ideas, especially if you can use 3D printing as rapid prototyping. All right. Thanks, guys.